Many men have related hideous things, not mentioned in print, which happened on the battlefields of the Great War. Some of these things have made me faint, others have convulsed me with devastating nausea, while still others have made me tremble and look behind me in the dark. Yet despite the worst of them, I believe I can myself relate the most hideous thing of all. The shocking, the unnatural, the unbelievable horror from the shadows. In 1915, I was a physician with the rank of first lieutenant in a Canadian regiment in Flanders, one of many Americans to precede the government itself into the gigantic struggle. I had not entered the army on my own initiative, but rather as a natural result of the enlistment of the man whose indispensable assistant I was, the celebrated Boston surgical specialist, Dr. Herbert West. Dr. West had been avid for a chance to serve as surgeon in a great war, and when the chance had come, he carried me with him, almost against my will. There were reasons why I would have been glad to let the war separate us, reasons why I found the practice of medicine and the companionship of West more and more irritating, but when he had gone to Ottawa and through a colleague's influence secured a medical commission as major, I could not resist the imperious persuasion of one determined that I should accompany him in my usual capacity. When I say that Dr. West was avid to serve in battle, I do not mean to imply that he was either naturally warlike or anxious for the safety of civilization. Always an ice-cold intellectual machine, slight, blonde, blue-eyed, and spectacled, I think he secretly sneered at my occasional martial enthusiasms and censures of supine neutrality. There was, however, something he wanted in embattled Flanders, and in order to secure it he had to assume a military exterior. What he wanted was not a thing which many persons want, but something connected with the peculiar branch of medical science which he had chosen quite clandestinely to follow, and in which he had achieved amazing and occasionally hideous results. It was, in fact, nothing more or less than an abundant supply of freshly killed men in every stage of dismemberment. Herbert West needed fresh bodies because his life work was the reanimation of the dead. This work was not known to the fashionable clientele who had so swiftly built up his fame after his arrival in Boston, but was only too well known to me, who had been his friend and sole assistant since the old days in Miskatonic University Medical School at Arkham. It was in those college days that he had begun his terrible experiments, first on small animals and then on human bodies shockingly obtained. There was a solution which he injected into the veins of dead things, and if they were fresh enough they responded in strange ways. He had had much trouble in discovering the proper formula, for each type of organism was found to need a stimulus especially adapted to it. Terror stalked him when he reflected on his partial failures, nameless things resulting from imperfect solutions or from bodies insufficiently fresh. A certain number of these failures had remained alive. One was in an asylum, while others had vanished. And as he thought of conceivable yet virtually impossible eventualities, he often shivered beneath his usual stolidity. West had soon learned that absolute freshness was the prime requisite for useful specimens, and had accordingly resorted to frightful and unnatural expedients in body snatching. In college, and during our early practice together in the factory town of Bolton, my attitude toward him had been largely one of fascinated admiration. But as his boldness in methods grew, I began to develop a gnawing fear. I did not like the way he looked at healthy living bodies. And then there came a nightmarish session in the cellar laboratory, when I learned that a certain specimen had been a living body when he secured it. That was the first time he had ever been able to revive the quality of rational thought in a corpse, and his success, obtained at such a loathsome cost, had completely hardened him. Of his methods in the intervening five years I dare not speak. I was held to him by sheer force of fear, and witnessed sights that no human tongue could repeat. Gradually I came to find Herbert West himself more horrible than anything he did. That was when it dawned on me that his once normal scientific zeal for prolonging life had sub subtly degenerated into a mere morbid and ghoulish curiosity and secret sense of carnal picturesqueness. His interest became a hellish and perverse addiction to the repellently and fiendishly abnormal. He gloated calmly over artificial monstrosities which would make most healthy men drop dead from fright and disgust, he became, behind his pallid intellectuality, a fastidious bordelaire of physical experiment, a language elegabulous of the tombs. Dangers he met unflinchingly. Crimes he committed unmoved. I think the climax came when he had proved his point that rational life can be restored, and had sought new worlds to conquer by experimenting on the reanimation of detached parts of bodies. 
He had wild and original ideas on the independent vital properties of organic cells and nerve tissue separated from natural physiological systems, and achieved some hideous preliminary results in the form of never-dying, artificially nourished tissue obtained from the nearly hatched eggs of an indescribable tropical reptile. Two biological points he was exceedingly anxious to settle. First, whether any amount of consciousness and rational action be possible without the brain, proceeding from the spinal cord and various nerve centres, and second, whether any kind of ethereal, intangible relation distinct from the material cells may exist to link the surgically separated parts of what has previously been a single living organism. All this research work required a prodigious supply of freshly slaughtered human flesh, and that was why Herbert West had entered the Great War. The phantasmal, unmentionable thing occurred at one midnight late in March 1915, in a field hospital behind the lines at St. Eloy. I wonder even now if it could have been other than a demonic dream of delirium. West had a private laboratory in an east room of the barn-like temporary edifice, assigned to him on his plea that he was devising new and radical methods for the treatment of hitherto hopeless cases of maiming. There, he worked like a butcher in the midst of his gory wares. I could never get used to the levity with which he handled classified certain things. At times, he actually did perform marvels of surgery for the soldiers, but his chief delights were of a less public and philanthropic kind, requiring many explanations of sounds which seemed peculiar even amidst the babble of the damned. Among these sounds were frequent revolver shots, surely not uncommon on the battlefield, but distinctly uncommon in a hospital. Dr. West's reanimated specimens were not meant for long existence or a large audience. Besides human tissue, West employed much of the reptile embryo tissue which had, he had cultivated with such singular results. It was better than human material for maintaining life in organless fragments, and that was now my friend's chief activity. In a dark corner of the laboratory, over a queer incubating burner, he kept a large covered vat full of this reptilian cell matter, which multiplied and grew puffily and hideously. On the night of which I speak, we had a splendid new specimen. A man at once physically powerful and of such high mentality that a sensitive nervous system was assured. It was rather ironic, for he was the officer who had helped West to his commission, and who was now to have been our associate. Moreover, he had in the past secretly studied the theory of reanimation to some extent under West. Major Sir Eric Morland Clapham Lee, DSO, was the greatest surgeon in our division, and had been hastily assigned to the St. Eloy Sector, sector when news of the heavy fighting reached headquarters. He had come in an aeroplane piloted by the intrepid Lieutenant Ronald Hill, only to be shot down when directly over his destination. The fall had been spectacular and awful. Hill was unrecognisable afterward, but the wreck yielded up the great surgeon in a nearly decapitated but otherwise intact condition. West had greedily seized the lifeless thing which had once been his friend and fellow scholar, and I shuddered when he finished severing the head placing it in his hellish vat of pulpy reptile tissue to preserve it for future experiments, and proceeded to treat the decapitated body on the operating table. He injected new blood, joined certain veins, arteries, and nerves at the headless neck, and closed the ghastly aperture with engrafted skin from an unidentified specimen which had borne an officer's uniform. I knew what he wanted, to see if this highly organised body could exhibit, without its head, any of the signs of mental life which had distinguished Sir Eric Morland Clapham Lee, once a student of reanimation, this silent trunk was now gruesomely called upon to exemplify it. I can still see Herbert West under the sinister electric light as he injected his reanimating solution into the arm of the headless body. The scene I cannot describe. I should faint if I tried it. For there is madness in a room full of classified carnal things, with blood and lesser human debris almost ankle-deep on the slimy floor, with hideous reptilian abnormalities sprouting, bubbling and baking over a winking bluish-green spectre of dim flame in a far corner of black shadows. The specimen, as West repeatedly observed, had a splendid nervous system. Much was expected of it, and as a few twitching motions began to appear, I could see the feverish interest on West's face. He was ready, I think, to see proof of his increasingly strong opinion that consciousness, reason, and personality can exist independently of the brain, that man has no central connective spirit, but is merely a machine of nervous matter, each section more or less complete in itself. In one triumphant demonstration, West was about to relegate the mystery, the mystery of life, to the category of myth. The body now twitched more vigorously, and beneath our avid eyes commenced to heave in a frightful way. The arms stirred disquietingly, 
The legs drew up, and various muscles contracted in a repulsive kind of writhing. Then the headless thing threw out its arms in a gesture which unmistakably was one of desperation, an intelligent desperation apparently sufficient to prove every theory of Herbert West. Certainly, the nerves were recalling the man's last act in life, the struggle to get free of the falling aeroplane. What followed, I shall never positively know. It may have been wholly a hallucination from the shock caused at that instant by the sudden and complete destruction of the building in a cataclysm of German shellfire. Who can gainsay it, since West and I were the only proved survivors? West liked to think that before his recent disappearance, but there were times when he could not, for it was queer that we both had the same hallucination. The hideous occurrence itself was very simple, notable only for what it implied. The body on the table had risen with a blind and terrible groping, and we had heard a sound. I should not call that sound a voice, for it was too awful, and yet its timber was not the most awful thing about it. Neither was its message. It had merely screamed, Jump, Ronald, for God's sake, jump. The awful thing was its source. For it had come from the large covered vat in that ghoulish corner of crawling black shadows.